welcome back to New Centre. Thank you very much for staying with us. I don't know to bring in my colleague Rita Sunina joining us from our City Centre studio. And she will be, of course, uh, uh, talking to us about that detailed um, ruling that will be given later on today by the Supreme Court judges. Rita, good morning. So what are we expecting in this uh, detailed explanation of uh, the decision that was arrived at by the uh, Supreme Court judges? Good morning to you, Betty. Later on in the day, what we are expecting is the Supreme Court to give the reasons in detail as to why it decided to uphold the victory of Uhuru Kenyatta in the October 26th uh, repeat presidential poll. Remember, they issued a summary judgment on the 20th of last month, and that is when they promised that they would give a detailed uh, judgment in 21 days. Those 21 days are uh, lapsed today. This second petition, remember this was the second petition following the elections. The first petition uh, was after the August 8th elections and which was filed uh, by NASA. This second petition was filed by former MP Harun Mwau and two activists, Elef Halifa as well as Njonjo Mue. And what the judges, among the issues that they will be addressing, these two cases by John Harun Mwau, Elef Halifa and Njonjo Mue uh, were consolidated, but lawyers for both of them, the both uh, parties, petitioners, uh, were allowed to make uh, their arguments in court. But during the summary judgment, the judges uh, said that they had uh, uh, consolidated the, both petitions into 14 issues. One of them is the issue of nominations. In his uh, petition, John Harun Mwau had argued that the IEBC failed to conduct fresh nominations ahead of the repeat presidential poll. The judges will also be explaining whether uh, the withdrawal of the NASA flag bearer Raila Odinga from the presidential race had any effect. Remember, Raila withdrew from the race on the 10th of October, just days uh, before the repeat presidential poll. And what uh, the petitioners were arguing is that the withdrawal of uh, Raila Odinga should have ensured that the IEBC had uh, called off the elections until fresh nominations were held, until other candidates uh, were given a chance to take part in the elections, despite the fact that uh, the High Court had ruled the following day after Raila Odinga withdrew on the 10th of October. The following day, the High Court ruled allowing uh, other candidates uh, to take part in the presidential uh, race. The other issue uh, that the judges will be explaining why uh, the IEBC, despite the fact that it did not hold elections in all 290 constituencies, why the Supreme Court went ahead uh, to uphold the election. The law requires that elections, for an election to be valid, elections should be held in all 290 constituencies. In this case, in the repeat presidential poll, elections were not held in 25 constituencies in four counties, Migori, Siaya, Homa Bay, as well as Kisumu, following the violence that was witnessed in those areas after NASA withdrew from the polls. That is also among the issues that the Supreme Court will be looking at, giving more reasons as to why, despite the fact that the elections were not held in all 290 constituencies, why this was a valid election. In the argument in court, the IEBC argued that it could not have waited uh, for the issue of the violence to be sorted out, for the violence to end before it, can, it could hold elections in those constituencies, arguing that the court, the Supreme Court had given only 60 days within which uh, the commission was to conduct the elections and so for the commission it argued that it could not postpone the elections to a later date outside the 60 days that had been stipulated by the Supreme Court. The other issue that we'll be expecting uh, to hear a detailed uh, uh, judgment from the judges this uh, afternoon is the issue of the Elect Electoral Laws Amendment Act. This act was passed uh, just before uh, the repeat presidential poll, and the petitioners had argued that that act had an effect which it shouldn't have on the repeat presidential poll. So the effect of the Electoral Laws Amendment Act, the issue that the fact uh, that the elections were not held in all 90 constituencies, the fact that the IEBC did not conduct any fresh uh, nominations before the elections, as well as the withdrawal of the NASA flag bearer Raila Odinga, will be among the issues, among 14 issues that the judges will be dealing with in their detailed judgment. Betty, this time round, it was a unanimous unanimous uh, decision by the court. Remember in the first petition which was filed by NASA and in which uh, the Supreme Court 
and sort of uh, made history with a landmark ruling uh, which nullified President Uhuru Kenyatta's victory in the August 8th elections, uh, paving with, with the way for the repeat presidential poll. In that first petition, it was four judges who uh, uh, ruled uh, to nullify President Uhuru Kenyatta's victory, and two judges had uh, dissenting opinion. This time, in this second petition by Harun Mwao and Jonjo uh, Muaz, Elef Halifa, all judges were unanimous in their decision, and so this afternoon, all six judges were unanimous, and so this afternoon we'll be waiting to hear in detail their explanation of what uh, influenced or what uh, made them come up with the decision to uphold uh, Uhuru Kenyatta's uh, victory in the October 26th election, in which also paved the way for his swearing in uh, last week, Betty. Rita, thank you for that. Now, before I let you go, Rita, what kind of reactions have we had so far from the petitioners? You remember that the first um, petition, you know, we had quite an uproar from Jubilee supporters. Uh, this time round, NASA was not, uh, you know, involved directly. Uh, we know that uh, maybe indirectly, but anyway. Uh, but really, what has been the reaction so far from the petitioners with regard to this, uh, the, the decision that was arrived at by the Supreme Court judges on this second one? Well, on this second one, as you mentioned, there are NASA, uh, its application uh, to be part of the suit, uh, uh, the judges declined to allow NASA to be enjoined as interested parties. And even after that judgment on the 20th of last month, there mm -hmm. was really uh, not, compared to the first petition, the reactions were not uh, as forthcoming as before. Mm -hmm. And already this time round, President Uhuru Kenyatta has already been sworn in. There was anxiety on the 20th as the country was waiting for the judges uh, uh, to deliver their ruling. Now that they delivered their summary judgment, which uh, upheld Uhuru Kenyatta's win, there isn't much. Now what the country is waiting to know, mm -hmm. and perhaps more so uh, for those in the legal fraternity, waiting to know exactly why the judges came up with a decision. This is basically in detail. Mm. The country already knows Uhuru Kenyatta's uh, victory was upheld, so why was it upheld? That is what we are waiting for this afternoon, Betty. All right, Trita Sina there reporting from our city centre studio. Like she mentioned, um, you know, the Supreme Court judges will be giving a detailed explanation of why they arrived at um, that decision of upholding uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta's win on the 26th of October. All right, so we'll come back to our discussion here in studio. And uh, Degwa, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, uh, before even we get back to our conversation earlier, what is it that you are expecting with this detailed explanation? Um, I am expecting that the judges are going to reconcile mm -hmm. that big question of the 25 constituencies that never sa uh, did uh, an election. Yeah. Reason being, um, the judges must be very careful not to balkanize this country. Mm -hmm and not to mean that democratic space ought to be constrained to some people and, and expanded to others. The, I also wish to see how they are going to reconcile the right of every Kenyan to participate in an election and to vote. So um, Article 138, which speaks about elections being held in each and every constituency, mm -hmm. and Article 38, which speaks that every Kenyan has a right to, yes. to vote, I want to see how the court is going to tell us whether a constitutional body enacted by the people of Kenya can decide that a particular region in the Republic of Kenya cannot and will not participate in an election. Secondly, I want to see how the court is going to dissuade future political processes from using the same reasons that were used during these second elections from disfranchising mm -hmm. a great number of Kenyans. The other thing I want the judges to tell us is whether or not that elections are, are held in the Republic of Kenya as a nation or as regions. Those are some of the reasons mm -hmm. that uh, uh, we are waiting to see and expecting to see. Secondly, right. we are also going to see how this jurisprudence from the court, now the 8th of August jurisprudence and the 26th of, of October jurisprudence, is going to inform the electoral processes, the future electoral processes. Essentially, what the judges should, be, should do, we are hoping that they are going to give us well thought out legal reasonings mm -hmm. that will help us arrest or abate the, the political uh, turmoil that this country has undergone 
because of what is called election and the electoral injustice or justice. All right. Interesting. So, so uh, as I sum up, then um, the question then would be, from what the court will tell us, is parliament ready? That is the National Assembly and the, county, uh, and the, and the Senate lead it to absolve the thinking and the wisdom of the judges to inform on our election act to our constitution. Our constitution needs to be relooked again. You remember the argument that actually uh, came out in court was that uh, despite that the 25 constituencies were not able to participate in an election, yeah. we did not have time for us to conduct a, a, a repeat election in those particular constituencies because of constraint of time. The question then would be, can the judges make a recommendation whether or not we need to look at the scope or the period in which a repeat election ought to be held All right. and expand the and number expand. of the days for, mm -hmm. for future eventualities mm. and posterity? Mm -hmm. We also need to look at, do we also need to look at the days in which the Supreme Court ought to take to look at a presidential election? Mm -hmm. Is the 14 days period enough. and widow enough for people to make substantive arguments and for the judges to have a clear thinking? Mm. Why am I asking this? I am asking this whether or not we need to look at the reason of uh, amending our constitution and expand the number of the days because... When, when we dealt with the uh, 8th of August election petition and the judgment that was given by the court, and mo most importantly, the, the, the judgment of the minority, we had Justice ja Jokin Dongol dissenting mm. and saying that uh, the elections were good. Okay, that was her judgment. Mm. But when, he came to her, when she came to her detailed judgment 21 days later, yeah. she gave a 400-page document of a judgment, which detailed and, and shown that she actually went to a length of, uh, of scrutinizing mm. the forms that were an issue during that court. Mm. So the question that came, and the question that has actually made her to be taken before the Judicial Service Commission for, 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 for investigation is, if, if you give us your, your, your short judgment within two days, and you told us that you were able to scrutinize all those documents. Were you able to scrutinize them within those two days so that the you can give days. your dissenting judgment? Yeah. yeah. So those are some legitimate some questions. Of the questions. And why we need to ask them, difficult as they may be, is because this country, democracy is premised on legal infrastructure. If we get the legal infrastructure wrong, we'll always get the political results wrong all right yes what do you think that uh, these two processes these two petitions um, uh, that have been handled by the supreme court yes. have done to our electoral process what has it ignited in this whole process because this is the first time really that we saw this major historic decision from the supreme court um in regards to the august 8th election but what else has it ignited uh, one one thing uh, betty the the, the two judgments have done mm -hmm they have entrenched the divisive politics in the Republic of Kenya. Just like really? you, you've heard Justice mm -hmm. Wanjala saying, mm -hmm. and, and actually uh, the, the, the retired chief justice saying in the interview that we gave, the clip that you've shown. Mm. Why, why? Because in, two, in, in August, on 1st of September, it is NASA who won. On, 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 on uh, 20th of October, of, October. of, yes, yes. of November, November, sorry, it is Jubilee who won. So this judgment, the, the, 20, the, the, the 1st of September judgment belongs to NASA. Mm. The, the 20th of November judgment belongs to Jubilee. So, and that's why you're asking um, uh, Rita, what is the mood outside mm. there? And mm. she was saying, mm. essentially, there's no excitement because we know the process of swearing in. There is no, the, proce the, 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 the divisive politics I'm talking about is when w we should be able to view judgments coming from courts as judgments belonging to a nation, mm. not, as, not a party, or, not a party, yeah. all a, a fraction, a political fraction. Mm. So the judgment of the, the Supreme Court mm -hmm. dealing with the most sensitive issue of the presidency ought to be accepted as a judgment that belongs to the Republic of Kenya. Mm. And that is why it was so bad in, in, in the judgment of 1st of September mm -hmm. when we saw one function 
predicting the other function. It has also repeated itself again, mm -hmm. saying, uh, when, you, when you've seen after the 20th of November, one group of political uh, grouping is ridiculing the other grouping. Essentially, the judgment should be able to have a reconciliatory mood and reconciliatory theme All right. so that you can put the nation together. Together. Yes. Uh, in terms of building jurisprudence, and I remember we had this conversation, yes. w mm -hmm. you know, whichever way the Supreme Court judges you know, would have um, you know, made this, the decision, either upholding this second one, uh, the win of Uhuru Kenyatta or not, yes. um, you know, that both scenarios would have still built jurisprudence Correct. for our electoral process. Yes. What do you think um, will be the take-homes? I know, I know we will be waiting for the detailed judgment to, to, yes. to understand that. But what do you think is uh, some, of, uh, some of the things that we can take home? Uh, just looking forward to the next um, processes, if we have any in future. I, I think uh, one of the take-homes that we must is to call the nation into a self-introspection mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. We need to have a self-introspectory processes of uh, reviewing the way we do our political processes. Mm -hmm. Most importantly, whether or not, we need to overhaul the, the Election Act. Secondly, whether we also need to overhaul the IBC Act and whether we also need to do amendments to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. let, me sp let me begin by the, 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 the suggestions that I'm making about overhauling the, the IBC Act. Remember, uh, the, the, the IBC mm -hmm. is the only body that is mandated to conduct an election in the Republic of Kenya, whether a fresh election, whether a general election, or a repeat election, or a relearn. And, and these three processes, these three elections, mm -hmm. have different consequences. And ele a general election that is successful and that is credible and that, and that is, yeah, that is uh, uh, laced with integrity means that it is going to be a result of an election that is going to be widely accepted. Mm -hmm. When it comes to Arilan, we still do not have a lot of divisive, uh, deceive, divisiveness in the country because it is the two runners up who are running. But when it comes to the, the fresh election that was, was, was ordered by the Supreme Court on, on, uh, on 1st of September, it comes as a result of a legal process that has been prejudiced, an election process that has been prejudiced, an election process that has not complied with the law, mm -hmm. an election process that has faulted and uh, had a lot of transgressions on the law, as opposed to a general election and a relearn. Okay. So the question then that needs to, 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 we need to interrogate is, a commission that presides over an election that is nullified, is it still competent enough to oversee a mm. fresh election? Mm. Or is it, is it laced with suspicions? And those suspicions are the ones that made uh, NASA to withdraw from the elections. Yeah, yeah. Remember, some of the clamors that they had were the clamors for uh, irreducible minimums. Mm. Some of the irreducible minimums that were being focused on were actually focused at the institution of the IBC yes. as a whole. So the question that, that begs thinking and we should be able to capture it from this judgment, is whether or not we need to amend our, our, our IBC Act to provide that if a commission presides over an election that is nullified. nullified. That's cons that commission mm -hmm. also stands nullified mm. at the time of the nullification. Mm. So that you can give the political players some confidence of approaching the, poli the next political processes of the fresh election. All right. God was on our side uh, in, in the 2000 and, uh, on the 26th of August, that Justice Mativo, sorry, 26th of October, mm. that Justice Mat Mativo expanded the scope and included the other presidential candidates. candidates yes. the, the, the narrative would have been different if there was not that high court case in court mm -hmm. and if Raila Odinga had actually withdrawn from the, uh, from the race. The narrative... The way probably we understand Kenya would have been a bit different. But that would have been necessitated by the actions mm. of the election commission. All right. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Mm. So we, we want to continue with the conversation we had started earlier um, because of time. And I want us to uh, play a bite by Musalia Mudavadi. Mm. Uh, let's just listen in to what he had to say about this uh, swearing in of Raila Odinga. Following extensive internal consultations and engagement with a wide range of national and international interlocutors, 
The NASA leadership wishes to advise the NASA fraternity and the general public that the swearing-in of Right Honorable Raila Molo Odinga and His Excellency Stephen Kalonzo Musyoka as President and Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya and the launch of the People's Assembly scheduled for Tuesday, 12th December, have been postponed to a later date. All right, so I just want us to uh, dig deeper into what Musale Mudavadi is saying. And the question has been, was Raila Odinga supposed to be sworn in as the president of Kenya or the president of the People's Assembly? And what are the differences between the two titles? I, I think, uh, Betty, um, it's still, it's still, um, I'm still at a loss uh -huh. as to what Raila Odinga would have become if indeed he was to be sworn in. Uh -huh. Why am I at a loss? I'm at a loss because the way the architecture and the design of our constitution mm -hmm. is, is portraying the whole processes. Legal arguments have it that the argument I brought for, uh, for, uh, earlier on yes. about the participatory democracy and the, the, and, and the delegated democracy still gives NASA's argument a place in the books of law. And the question then would have been, with this existing two systems of establishing and exercising our sovereignty, mm -hmm. if the people decide to exercise their sovereignty in the manner in which NASA was proposing, what would then be the status of the resultants of that processes? Mm -hmm. what, what would be the person be referred to? Remembering that is not a person who has undergone through the full processes of universal suffrage, yeah. where people cast their votes, but it's a, a, as a result of a concussion that is actually in our books of law of exercising our sovereignty directly. Remember, Betty, um, one thing that we must interrogate in our constitution mm -hmm. is that even when people go for, goes for universal suffrage, they are also exercising their powers directly. The question that then begs an answer is we are at a loss as to the outcomes of the two processes. Why? Because the question then would be, can Kenyans at a particular time abandon the universal suffrage mm -hmm. and go to Kasarani through acclamation and say, we have made you president? Mm. Yet those arguments find their place in our books of law. So that, that, that argument by NASA, the argument by Jubilee and, 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 uh, and the Givu Mugai is also calling us to have a self-introspection of the Constitution and see whether or not, whether in future, these two existing systems can bring turmoil, political mm -hmm. instability, and legal instability in the Republic of Kenya, and whether we need to exactly define the scopes of participatory democracy mm -hmm. and the scopes of um, uh, delegated, delegated democracy yeah. and whether the two systems ex ex exist uh, independently or in a complementary manner. But also mm. talking about the participatory um, uh, uh, exercising yes. of uh, the people's rights, if the People's Assembly was to be used, then would it need a leader? Because wouldn't that now go back to the delegated um, process then? You see, that's what I'm saying. We need to have a clear definition. And to mm -hmm. me, this actually requires an, an advisory opinion from the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be the results? Because if they go to the People's Assembly, mm -hmm. they crown Raila as the president. Then from that particular time, he will be exercising the what I'm calling the delegated democracy. Mm -hmm. But it has come from the people themselves. And that's the confusion the Constitution is bringing us into. And people should not look at it like we just need to say there is Section 40 of the Penal Code, we'll charge you for treason, mm -hmm. we, we, this is a mockery, I think mm. there are some guys who are, going, who are going nuts. No, it calls the country to a dialogue, mm. a political and a legal dialogue. Because if we do not have this dialogue at this particular time, we are about to have these things repeated again, and probably with more clamor and better stru uh, organized structures than it is now. All yes. right, <laughs> finally, uh, if Raila Odinga is sworn in at whatever point yes. as 
with whichever title, either yes, the yes. people's yes. president. Um, what will it have any impact, uh, considering that there is a president already who has been elected and sworn in as the president of this republic? You know, the, the, we, we need to understand that the origin of presidency or the origin of a political office, first of all, begins with a political process. Mm -hmm. So the political processes come first, then they are, they, they are crowned with legislations of laws. Mm. And the best example I would give is the 2007-2008 post-election violence. That political quagmire and that political, uh, uh, political process and the, and, and the standoff that was there by then mm. resulted into a political negotiation that created the offices of the prime minister, the deputy prime ministers, and the grad coalition. Mm -hmm. So the, the, grad, the, the, the accord itself, the act, was enacted after political compromises. So the legislation was done so that it could give some spices to the political process that had already been decided and been, the, and, and been taken as the way out for the processes that was, then, was there by then. So what I'm saying is that political processes came first, then they were crowned with legislations. All right. So if Raila Odinga succeeds in being sworn in, we must understand and we shall have to understand that a political process has commenced and it has brought these political processes. Then we might then be forced to look into our laws whether we need to expand the laws and accommodate that new legal process. Why? Because that, that, that political process of swearing in will, of course, bring some di political disability mm. in the country. Mm -hmm. And to accommodate that political disability, we must then probably think what somebody called Hans Kelsen thought mm -hmm. in the 18th century. Mm. Hans, Hans Kelsen was a legal, is a legal philosopher and is a legal jurist. He said, he, gave, he came up with what is called the Kelsenian pure theory of law. And the Kelsenian pure theory of law looks at legitimatizing that which was perceived as an illegitimate process. Mm. It is says, okay. it gives, as I sum up, it gives two legal processes. One, it calls it as an old legal order, and this new one, it calls it new legal order. So it says, the, the pure theory of law says that if a person succeeds in dislodging the old legal order and replaces it with a new legal order, as long as that new legal order is successful, then that new legal order becomes the legitimate legal order and is accepted as the legal order. And that's the argument mm. Raila Odinga is using. Wow. Yes. So this is not, this is not ending anytime it's, soon? It's not going to end anytime soon. Yes. Wow. Thank you very much, <laughs> Dago and Jiru. He is a lawyer. Thank you for your time. All right. So we will be uh, taking a short break, but we're coming back to continue with uh, our coverage here on News Center. Uh, don't go away. We still have another discussion that uh, you don't want to miss. Uh, we're talking about a new campaign against Charles.